have we, haven't we been asking this question for several years? Yeah, I think you're going to see continued, um, you know, continued uh, technological innovation, uh, particularly in hybrids. I, I'm not 100% convinced that the all-electric vehicle um, is really the future. I think Americans have a lot of range anxiety, uh, but certainly those, those hybrids are, are, are indeed, for a lot of consumers, um, a, a great uh, product that makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. And you're seeing that the Chevrolet Volt, which is a, um, a tremendous uh, vehicle, has, is having growing sales on an annual basis, um, month to month, tends to have growing sales. So for some people that makes sense. And I think that the sort of technological innovation you're going to see, particularly in batteries, as we were discussing earlier, is going to make that a more affordable product and allow you to have a, a quicker return on investment in terms of the gas savings. Do you think that the federal incentives and tax incentives that are in place for electric vehicles are important? When you talk to dealers, they'll tell you they're important. They'll tell you the dealers uh, are able to explain the tax credit that exists uh, to the consumer, um, and it, it does, in fact, uh, consumer, consumer decisions. It's important to keep, though, a, you know, a variety of uh, options available for, for consumers. And um, if we're going to meet the 2025 standards of 52.5 miles per gallon, uh, it's going to take uh, not just more hybrid vehicles, but it's also going to take continued improvement in the efficiency of the internal combustion engine. And the companies are focused on that. When you walk around the auto show, I'm sure they're going to have exhibits like they did last year that show some of the things they're doing to make that engine, that traditional uh, gasoline-powered engine, uh, even more efficient and uh, increase ga gas mileage. Next call for Matt Blunt who is president of the American Automotive Policy Council, Doug, in Syracuse, New York. Hi, Doug. Hi, hi good morning. Mr. Blount, I wonder if you can explain to the American taxpayer and consumer why the taxpayer bailout shouldn't be totally paid back by the government, to the government, by the big three automakers. Well, as, as I think, as you know, the, the, the government has a, an ownership stake in, in General Motors today, and um, they have worked with the government, General Motors, and the government have come to an agreement about uh, the uh, repurchase of those uh, share, uh, shares. Uh, as those shares are repurchased at a price set by the marketplace, uh, the government will exit ownership. Um, the auto sector is a unique sector, and um, you know, uh, uh, President George W. Bush, for example, was not naturally inclined uh, to provide the sort of assistance that he did to the auto sector, uh, but he recognized how important uh, it was to the American economy and the sort of unique supply chain that it, that it has. The length of the supply chain uh, is so significant that it would have been devastating, really, to the American economy to allow uh, the auto sector to cease to, cease to exist. Um, and then, obviously, President uh, Obama continued that work with the companies, really forced them to go through the sort of restructuring that everybody said was necessary, Republican or Democrat. Every American knew the companies needed to change. They went through that restructuring, and today they're profitable companies that are investing in the United States, hiring new workers, and really the bright spot uh, in what sometimes is a dismal uh, economy. Tillman tweets in, I think I'd rather go to the dentist than a car dealer. Next call comes from Ed from Dearborn, Michigan, headquarters of Ford. Hi, Ed. Good morning. I have a comment and a question. The comment is, I'm 70 years old, retired from Ford Motor Company. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was made in the USA. Now the common use is by American. I drive a 2011 Fusion. It's from Mexico. Uh, what is what is are these? Does this just mean that uh, the automobile companies are located and headquartered in the United States? No, not at all. Obviously, a tremendous amount of uh, production uh, for Ford and Chrysler and General Motors uh, occurs in the United States. Um, they produce a lot of the vehicles they sell here. Um, they, they, they sell here, they actually make here. Um, if you were to look at those, those uh, models that are coming out of uh, Mexico or Canada in terms of their final assembly, I think you'd find that there's generally a very high uh, domestic content of parts from, from the United States. A lot of the research and development, and this is something that gets lost. We spend 
really more in research and development in the auto sector than any other sector except for pharmaceuticals. A lot of that research, particularly for Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors, occurs right here in the United States. So if you really go through and look at the total value of a car, um, a, a significant amount of it is going to occur in America if it's a Chrysler, Ford, or General Motors product, regardless of where that, that final assembly is. Uh, as you know, I think li living in Michigan, there's been tremendous integration uh, along the U.S.-Canadian border in terms of auto production uh, since the early stages of the American automotive industry. Uh, and that's important to us. It keeps us competitive in the global economy. And again, that, that, that car that's assembled in Mexico is going to have a lot of U.S. content in terms of those parts. One in 17 jobs depends on autos and the automotive payroll in 2012, about $500 billion, according to the American Automotive Policy Council. Charles, Irwin, Pennsylvania. Please go ahead with your question for Matt Blunt. Uh, yes, yeah. um, I'm calling because I feel that uh, it's patriotism of the United States of America. People want to fly the flag, they should be buying American vehicles. Uh, also, it expands the middle class, and it becomes uh, a very uh, uh, encouraging for everybody to, uh, to, uh, to, to, the more people buy American stuff, the more Americans will buy. I ask unanimous consent to call the call be terminated. Without objection. I now move to proceed to calendar number S-47. The clerk will read. Motion to proceed to calendar number one, S-47, a bill to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act of 1994. Madam President, I now ask unanimous consent to proceed to pre-order morning business. Senator is allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. <clears throat> I ask unanimous consent to proceed to S-Res 24. The clerk will report. S-Res 24, commemorating the 10-year anniversary of the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. I ask unanimous consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, motion we consider be considered made and laid on the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. I now ask that we move to SRES 25. The clerk will report. SRES 25, honoring Gonzaga University on its 125th anniversary. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. I ask unanimous consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be considered laid on the table, and the motion to reconsider be laid on the table with no intervening action or debate. There are two bills at the desk due for their first reading. I ask that those readings take place. The clerk will report. S-201, a bill to prohibit the sale, lease, transfer, retransfer, or delivery of F-16 aircraft, M-1 tanks, or certain other defense articles or services to the government of Egypt. S-204, a bill to preserve and protect the free choice of individual employees to form, join, or assist labor organizations or to refrain from such activities. I ask for second reading on both these measures, but object to my own request on both measures. The objection is heard. The bills will be read the second time in the next legislative day. I ask unanimous consent that Natalie Beckman, a fellow in my office, be granted four privileges for the remainder of calendar year 2013. Without objection. I now ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it adjourn until 2 p.m. on Monday, February 4th. That following the prayer and the pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired, the journal proceedings will be approved to date. The time for the two leaders will be reserved for use later in the day. With and that following any leader remarks, the Senate be in a period of morning business until 5 p.m. The Senate is permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. <clears throat> <clears throat> the following morning business, Senate resume consideration of motion to proceed S-47, and the time until 5.30 be equally divided and controlled in the usual form. Finally, at 5.30, the Senate proceed to vote on the motion to proceed S-47. Without objection. The next roll call vote will be at 5.30 p.m. on the motion to proceed to the Violence Against Women's Act, Women Act. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order.
The Senate stands adjourned until 2 p.m. on Monday. The Senate gaveling out. Members today passed a bill to suspend the debt limit until May 19th. It also includes a provision that would suspend member salaries if either the House or Senate has not adopted a budget by April 15th. With the measure having passed the House last week, it now heads to the President for a signature. Live coverage of the Senate, as always, on C-SPAN 2. For more on the agreement to suspend the debt limit, we spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter. Lori Montgomery, economic